Hello, and welcome to today's panel discussion on long-term care and COVID-19. I'm Kevin Quigley, the scholarly director of the McKechnie Institute for Public Policy and Governance. Today's panel is hosted in partnership with the Faculty of Medicine at Dalhousie University. As we begin this event, we acknowledge that we are here today in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. We also recognize the histories, contributions, and legacies of the African Nova Scotian people who have been here for over 400 years. I'm pleased to kick off our four-week Policy Matters speaker series. Over the next month, we'll be hosting panels every Thursday. On February 25th, next week, we'll be discussing tourism recovery. On March 4th, we will discuss climate adaptation. And on March 11th, we'll be discussing racial politics. Many other topics could have been selected. These particular topics were picked because they are important and represent research and community engagement work that we are currently doing at the McKechnie Institute. Our intention is to create an opportunity for a frank exchange among experts about important issues that impact our communities. These events are not strictly about characterizing the problem, but also identifying solutions. We've encouraged our panelists to share forward-looking ideas and policies in light of the challenges and opportunities we'll be discussing. Our hope is that these ideas will be shared, discussed, and tested widely. Then good ideas will emerge and will be taken up by our politicians in the upcoming provincial election set to occur sometime within the next year. To further support this initiative, we are also hosting an op-ed competition open to all registered Dalhousie University students. In addition to cash prizes for winning submissions, selected op-eds may be published on our website and all entrants will be invited to an online workshop hosted by the McKechnie Institute on pitching an op-ed to the media. Please look at our website for more details. The deadline to submit an op-ed is March 4th. We know Zoom fatigue is real. With this in mind, we will keep our sessions short to one hour. There will be a brief opportunity for audience questions at the end of today's session. Today, we'll be talking about one of the most salient issues during the pandemic, long-term care. I'm delighted to introduce Pauline Dakin, our moderator for today's discussion. Pauline is an assistant professor of journalism at the University of King's College, and has spent over 20 years working for the CBC as a national health and medicine reporter. We are indeed pleased to have her moderate today's discussion. Over to you, Pauline. Thanks so much, Kevin. Uh, and I would like to say welcome to everybody who's joining us uh, this afternoon. We have a capacity crowd on Zoom, which is great. Uh, also a shout out to the overflow folks on Facebook. Um, it's heartening to know that so many people care so deeply about this topic. Uh, so as Kevin said, I did follow this, uh, or I was a national health reporter, and I did follow the issues surrounding aging and long-term care for many years, and I'm looking forward to hearing from our panel. And of course, COVID-19 has exposed some of the critical long-standing deficiencies in the delivery of long-term care in Nova Scotia and across the country. Uh, but the system was deeply dysfunctional long before the pandemic. It, it did dramatically and uh, tragically showcase the ways that we have collectively failed our elder population. Today, our panel of speakers uh, has enormous expertise related to aging and long-term care. They're going to speak to some of the challenges and more importantly, uh, propose solutions for moving forward. So to start things off, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Kenneth Rockwood. Uh, Dr. Rockwood is a professor of medicine at Dalhousie University who specializes in geriatric medicine and neurology. He is the Catherine Allen Weldon Professor of Alzheimer Research and a staff physician at the Queen Elizabeth II Health Sciences Center here in Halifax. He is considered a leading authority on frailty and dementia. Uh, Ken, we begin with you. Thanks, Pauline. Um, uh, I'm glad for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, just a couple of things that I'm aiming to say. Uh, one is that we need to act now. So population aging is really gonna catch up with us very soon. The second thing is that we need a range of nimble options. We can't just imagine doing one thing is uh, gonna be where the answer lies. And the third thing, which is really important is that we can do it. I, I, I think as difficult as our experience with COVID-19 
was at the start, we've demonstrated that in the face of an international health crisis, we're able to come forward and we're able to work together to get things done. And I think we need to bring that same spirit to bear on population aging. So let's go back to the first thing we have to act now, there's a reason for that. So, so many people um, uh, who are watching this will know what an exponential process is. And that's what we're dealing with, with aging. And we're coming to what for most people is gonna be their last doubling time. So here's what I mean by that. For technical reasons, we don't really start to age till we're 15 years old. And we age at a rate of between uh, 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 4.5 to 6 percent per year. So let's take the lower end, 4.5 percent. That means that there's a doubling of the number of things that people have wrong with them due to age every 15 years, starting from age 15. So the worry is not what happens when you're 15 years old and you've got almost nothing wrong with you, and then you become 30, you still got almost nothing wrong. The worry is what happens towards the end of life, and for most people the 15 year interval between age 75 and age 90 is for them their last doubling time because unlike saving money in the bank this doesn't go on forever there's a limit uh, beyond which you can't live independently there's a limit to the number of things you have wrong with you beyond which you can't live and so for most people the last doubling time they experience is between the ages of 75 and 90. and that means that not by coincidence most of the dementia that we see happens during that age. Most of the hospitalization for congestive heart failure we see happen during that time. Most of the hospitalizations we see for chronic obstructive lung disease and a host of other illnesses happen in that time. And what's important is that we're in 2021 and 2021 is the year when the leading edge of the baby boom begins to turn 75. So we're I think right now past the time when we can talk about preparing for an aging population. The aging population is here. This wave is really about to crash on us. And we need to be able to react to it. And so that means that we have to start preparing. And the way we're going at right now is we're not doing enough and we're not doing it quickly enough. And we're not choosing solutions that are going to be helpful to us. And the reason I say that is this, the fundamental fact of aging is that the problems of old age come as a package. Very few people have just one thing wrong in that age group, 75 to 90. And the reason that's important is because, um, or sorry, very few people come to the hospital have just one thing wrong. And that's where I want to, that's the end that I want to talk about. So what's happened in healthcare is we've had tremendous success that has beguiled us in a way because we had the success by knowing more and more and more about one thing wrong at a time. And if you go to any modern teaching hospital like the QE2, there's almost any problem you can think of and someone is an expert in that problem. And that's really important for the provision of care for people who have that problem. It's less useful when they have that problem and five or six other things wrong because the problem doesn't exist in exactly the same way. And we have difficulty dealing with the different ways in which that problem might exist. And as a healthcare system, we're not at our best in looking after people with many things wrong all at once. We've heard the announcement, which I think is for the most part welcome, that we're going to really dramatically up our game in long-term care. We're going to do a better job in, uh, in the institutions that we have. We're going to add more beds. But I'm nervous when I hear that one of the reasons we're going to add more beds is because we've got all these long stay patients in acute care hospitals. And we hear of people you know, demanding that we solve that problem by building more beds. You will never solve the problem of long stay patients in acute care hospitals by building more long term care beds. People who need long term care don't come from Mars. They're not dropped off by on caring families. They're not unsuitable patients who came to the hospital to annoy us. A very large important fraction of what we see in people who wind up requiring long-term care didn't come into the hospital with the idea that that was what they're going to need. We in the acute care system have had a hand in creating that demand or creating that need to serve people in long-term care institutions. And we got to stop it. We have to change what we do so that we take into account how we provide care. Some of this is kind of technical, but a lot of it is not. 
right now in hospitals we've gotten used to and we're obliged to act because the way we've built our hospitals and structured the services without full regard to making sure that patients get a good night's sleep or we can get away with in younger people not being on top of their pain all the time or allowing small electrolyte abnormalities to float around without attention to them because that will always get caught up uh, in the fullness of time we don't mobilize people early. We don't pay attention to the meds they're on when we're prescribing new meds. There's a bunch of things like that that we have to change. We have to stop thinking about patients in the beds as bed blockers, which is still a term one hears. And we need to think the more of stranded patients, people who have gotten stuck in our system. So there's a range of things that we need to do, including especially at the acute care, long-term care interface. We need to look at how people come to acute care and how they wind up in long-term care. And we have to look at how people come to acute care from long-term care facilities and what we can do. And that means a lot of uncomfortable conversations. One of the most uncomfortable which is to act appropriately for people whose behavior is inappropriate, people with behavioral and psychological problems of dementia for the most part. For the most part, people go into long-term care because they've got dementia. For the most part, they get in trouble in long-term care when they have behavioral problems. At the moment, that's a potent stimulus to have them shipped off to the hospital. And when they arrive here, no matter what we do, because it takes mostly we can you know, help people out in specialized facilities, like we have the QE2 at the Nova Scotia Hospital, we can help most people somewhere between three and six weeks. But we face this problem of exit block, which is proven to be intractable. Once they're fixed, they have the mark of the beast on them. No one wants to take them back. No one wants to admit them to uh, a long-term care institution. We have to have ways, innovative ways, non-punitive ways to start to address those problems. And there are, a, there are proven ways that we can do this. We just need to adopt them now. We have to look at things like community paramedicine. We have to make it just as easy to discharge someone from hospital when they're in the emergency department as it is to admit them. Right now, it's much easier to admit someone. So what do we do? We admit them. We can't blame people for acting in the way that the system encourages them to behave. We have to look at it from a system standpoint to what we're going to do. And though there's quite a laundry list of things that might be done, and it may seem hard in order to know what to do in what order, it's, it's, it's reasonably straightforward based on how the evidence works and based on how and why the evidence works the way that it does in terms of an inventory of things that we can do. And we need to get on with that. And I put this particularly in the context of long-term care. Like we, we've heard over the next few years, we're going to build about 400 new beds. Supposing it was only $250 a day for the beds, that would be $100,000 a day. I'm talking about programs that, and that $100,000 a day will go on into perpetuity. I'm talking about programs that can be had, that can be done for no more than that on a, on a scale that can allow us to offer alternatives and to not do things that will simply increase the number of patients who get stranded uh, in hospital. And though that's a big challenge, if we think back on the steps we've made, the strides we've made in our understanding with COVID-19 of where we are now compared to where we started from, of what we know now compared to what we knew a year ago, and contrast that with a lot of other places in the world, I think the point can be amply made that this is something we can do. So we need to act now. There are things we can do, and we've got to believe that we can do it. And I'll stop there, Pauline. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Rockwood. Our second panelist is Dr. Janice Keefe. Dr. Keefe is Professor and Chair of Family Studies and Gerontology at Mount St. Vincent University. She holds the Lena Isabel Jodry Chair in Gerontology and is Director of the Nova Scotia Center on Aging. She also worked on the Royal Society of Canada's recent report, Restoring Trust, COVID-19, on the future of long-term care in Canada. Welcome, Janice. Thank you very much, Pauline, and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I, my whole area of uh, research in the past decade has really focused on long-term care and home care and family caregivers, and I am 
very welcome uh, to have the opportunity to speak about this. And I'm, I'm glad I'm after uh, Dr. Rockwood. I think it, what he's talked about, about that interface between long-term care and hospital is a critical one and there are solutions. And I agree with him, we can't wait. We also have to do things in tandem. So I'm gonna focus more on the actual place sector long-term care and first of all I want to say this is the residence home we have to value that this is where many of older people in our midst will live out their last days and this is their home it's not a hospital we need to be able to value their contributions we need to be able to provide them a quality of life by giving them quality of care by ensuring the staff that work with them and support them have a quality of work life and so that's where I think we need to look for some of the solutions so there's just been a recent uh, publication that looked at the last 20 years in Canada, there's been over 80 reports just on long-term care. And two thirds of those have said, we need to do something about staffing. We need to improve staffing. And so did the Royal Society report. We do need to understand that right now, staff in long-term care are very undervalued underpaid in most provinces. And so we have this difficulty and it was exposed as we know by the pandemic that oftentimes people are working casual hours and therefore they're working at multiple places. So we need to think about how to offer them full-time positions with paid sick leave and with benefits so that we can it can become a more attra attractive place to work. We need to make sure that th those staff have the appropriate training about dementia and about care for older people. We need ongoing education and training for the staff. So we really need to value the contributions that they make in the lives of day to day off, off the residents. And right now, immediately, we need to consider their mental health. They have been through such a stressful, we've all been through stress with the pandemic, but these individuals, many of whom have seen people die without their family because of the situation they were in. So we really do have to reach out to them. And we do need to recognize the family caregiver and family and friends uh, designated um, caregiver or partner in care, call them what you will. They're, we realize that they are a very valuable contribution to the care of older people in long-term care. And so we have to figure out better how to uh, enable those um, members to continue to provide care to their loved ones in the facility. So all of this comes with the need for funding. And I'm a very strong advocate of the federal government role here. I very much uh, believe that we need better national standards. We need to tie the federal government needs to put a significant uh, contribution into long-term care, and it needs to be tied to outputs. And by outputs, um, not only national standards, but adherence to those standards. And how do we do that? We need data. So Nova Scotia is one of the few provinces, uh, PEI being the other, uh, that doesn't have a uh, regular resident assessment tool in the facility that we can actually do comparison between and among nursing homes, but also across our country with the way uh, care is delivered in other places. So I think this is really fundamental. If we don't, if we're not able to uh, understand the level of care, we know it's increased. We know there's a higher level of acuity. We know that staffing levels have not kept up with that, but how do we show uh, our governments that we, we do need more staff unless we have some of the data to be able to um, to to be able to um, assess that. And there's many things that we could be doing in terms of interventions, 
and implementation of programs to support staff, to support residents. We need to get away, and I think this is very similar, um, that people go into the home, they walk into the home, and within three months, they're in a wheelchair, and they're not able to get around. So we need to have a mixture of staff that will include include not just care aides or resident care workers or continuing care assistants, whatever you call them in your province, but we need to have uh, PTOT assistance to help with people getting around, being mobile, providing some joy in their life in the facility so that they have that good quality of care. So I just want to end just by saying, you know, so many older people do not want to go into long-term care. So why is that? I mean, imagine, imagine a time when in fact, people are not afraid to go to long-term care, that they know that they will be respected, there will be joy in that facility. And the people that work with them, they too will also be valued. And the family members will be less guilty and feel much better about the situation because their loved one is being cared in a place that has adequate resources and has a value in our society that we haven't seen and has been terribly exposed uh, during our pandemic. So we are able to fix this. We just need to make that choice. It's our choice to make. Let's do it. Back to you, Pauline. Thank you, Janice, and, and for that quite wonderful vision that you, uh, that you paint. Um, we now welcome our third and final panel, panelist, Dr. David Sabapathy, is the Deputy uh, Chief Public Health Officer for the province of Prince Edward Island. Uh, PEI has, as most people know, had great success keeping COVID-19 out of long-term care facilities. I'm sure there's much to be learned from that. Um, David, could you tell us a, a little bit about Prince Edward Island's approach during this pandemic? Absolutely, and thank you uh, for inviting me to be on the panel. Um, right away, I, I will emphasize uh, what you mentioned. I'm not a, a long-term care expert, but like my fellow panelists, uh, I am a public health physician, though. I work in the Ministry of Health, Chief Public Health Office in PEI, and like all public health professionals, have been swept up in the addressing the COVID pandemic, particularly for long-term care. I'll share brief, briefly with you my experience. Um, as we mentioned, uh, across Canada, over half of the outbreaks currently going on are in long-term care facilities, and about 70% of all mortality in Canada attributed uh, to those facilities. But I'm proud to say that in PEI, we have had only one, that's right, one case of COVID-19 related to our long-term care homes, uh, no hospitalizations and no deaths. Um, to give you a sense of how many facilities we have, there's, um, by my count, 20 facilities with long-term care residents, 10 public, 2 private, and another 8 that are private that are dual long-term care and community care facilities. So what worked well in helping us keep uh, COVID-19 out of these facilities? Um, right away, I have to say that it, it helps to be an island. Um, <laughs> strong border control at our uh, few points of entry. Uh, really assisted, but then we also monitored and called all individuals uh, who were in self-isolation, and we had a strong testing regimen. And this ensured that we had no community spread of COVID uh, across the island, and that continues today. We had put in place a long-term care visitation order, similar to other jurisdictions, and we divided people who were going to enter the facility as visitors into general visitors and partners in care. And partners in care were these individuals that could have more direct uh, contact with residents in their rooms. And visitors had to, uh, in general, although we've moved it uh, around a little bit, we had to meet in designated areas. Combining that with rigorous screening at the point of entry into the facility. Once in the facility, we screened residents and staff. There was no shortage of PPE and there was early masking policies uh, for staff. There was an order that we put out as well, a public health order on restricting staff movement between long-term care facilities. And I'll mention uh, the difficulties that that imposed on uh, staffing, which uh, our panelists have mentioned. We did um, a rigorous testing of our residents when they're being transferred and or admitted to facilities and 
Combining that with no community transmission allowed us to not strand people in acute care as Dr. Locke would uh, alluded to. Um, we didn't have to self-isolate those individuals because um, we knew with the testing regime in the setting of no community transmission, we wouldn't have to self-isolate. But very hard to do that in long-term care and often leaves people stranded in acute care. But overall, I would say the key to our success Actually, one of the keys was strong communication. Because of the number of facilities we have, we were able to have early, often um, ongoing communication with both public and private facilities. Uh, we got to hear what their concerns were. We were able to support the private facilities with infection prevention control, um, education. And, you know, part of it's PEI, you know, we get to know <laughs> what's going on, what's not working well through the grapevine, and it comes to our attention immediately and we can go address it. Um, I'll talk then just about the challenges that we had. Um, the public health order restricting staff movement. Well, a lot of the facilities depending on casual staff, and I think Dr. Keith uh, uh, alluded to this, um, that was a challenge for us. And the department uh, did a needs assessment um, around which facilities were impacted by this order and then launched a recruitment campaign to try and find staff resources. Not that they're easy to find, but at least it was an effort and there was some funding put behind that. Um, at one point, we did stop all visitation to long-term care. And I think in retrospect, we view that as something we don't want to do Again, we don't want to strand our residents without that social support. So we have committed uh, with all the people working on this that we would, even in a risk, more uh, risky situation, allow at least one partner in care to be able to access the facility at all times. And lastly, even though we try and um, issue these public health orders, it's hard to get consistency amongst all facilities. And that's always been something we've tried to work on. Sometimes facilities want to be uh, more strict with their rules around infection prevention. There's not too much we can do about that, um, but we try and get everybody on board. So where we are today is uh, we've rolled out um, uh, vaccine to residents and staff and completed that delivery. Um, the public health order on staff restriction of movement has been lifted for vaccinated staff and that's about it because we're not in a position right now to lift any other public health restrictions in keeping with national guidance. We're taking a very cautious approach right now, but we're looking forward to that time where we can lift things even further. Um, and I, I just want to say thank you to all those who have helped uh, contribute to this good situation in PDI, and certainly uh, not me by myself by any means. Um, so I'll close my closing statement is really things have been different in PEI than the rest of Canada. It's really up to the experts <laughs> and us in dialogue to talk about, are these lessons scalable to other jurisdictions? Uh, and what does it mean uh, for some of these other systemic issues in long-term care? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sabathathy. And uh, thanks to everyone on the panel for sharing your thoughts and expertise. Uh, we're now moving to a focused discussion period uh, with a few questions to start with the panel and we're going to try and keep some time aside so that uh, we can take questions from our online audience. Um, as Dr. Rockwood mentioned, you know, we hear of seniors stranded in hospitals waiting for long term care placements referred to as bed blockers. Um, and as Dr. Keefe spoke about, we've allowed their final homes to be under maintained, understaffed. I'm wondering to what degree are the failures in long-term care a symptom of ageism in our society and in our institutions? Um, and how do you address that? So uh, Ken, can we start with you on that? Yeah, so, so I think it's undoubtedly the case that ageism has played a, a, a role. It, it's been really interesting for me personally, I'm just making this point to, to show how difficult these conversations can be. So um, I, I remember uh, Chris McKnight, the guy who's the current head of geriatrics, 
um, gave a talk about 15 years ago in which he really called us out on ageism in healthcare. And people were really uncomfortable about that. And there was a lot of pushback and, 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 and such. And I think that a, a lot of people felt, look, I'm an intelligent person of goodwill and I'm trying my best to care for my patients. You know, like, how dare you say that I'm capable of this ageist behavior? And it was the first time that I kind of come to grips my own mind with the notion of, of, of a structuralism, like a structural racism or a structural anything. And it's something I've reflected on numerous times since because we do see behavior that um, uh, is ageist and it's ageist in a way that's unwitting. People are doing what they've been role modeled to do. People use words that they believe to be acceptable, some of which enjoy administrative sanctions such as the bed blocker. And it takes quite a lot of persuasion to bring people around to 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 think about it in a new way, and it's not easy to call out colleagues. So 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 um, so I think that undoubtedly it's true, and undoubtedly it's a tough nut to crack. Over. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Janice. What would you say uh, are ways of going about cracking that nut? <laughs> You're muted, so we'll just let you unmute. It was hi hiding in the corner this time. Sorry about that. Uh, very good question. It begins with us every each and every one of us. Um, and so it's funny, Ken talked about colleague, I, colleagues, I was just chatting with another chair and, and she said, I can't, I'll never forget the day when I said, oh, I'm getting too old for this. And you called me out and said, what do you mean? That's ageism. Um, and, and I think that, I think we need to, you know, really, I, I know it sounds a little funny, but you know what? We, we are all getting older and yes, there are some deficits that come to that, but the age itself is not what the issue is. So we do need to uh, talk to each other about those uh, little sayings, seniors moments, you know, all of those things that we talk about, which tends to degrade the the elderly in our society. And so, um, and, and generally we should be talking about older people um, because there's a whole range of, uh, in, in like any age group, abilities, interests, uh, intellectual capacity, et cetera. And so um, when it becomes structuralized and it affects funding, that's when there's a real crisis. And I think we, we've obviously seen that during the pandemic, absolutely. Uh, David, what would you add to that? Well, uh, I mean, we painted a nice picture of PEI keeping COVID out of our facilities. And I guess the question, um, which I didn't fully address, you know, did it come at some kind of cost uh, to our residents? Um, I mentioned the visitation uh, being difficult at times. Um, you know, is it a, a bias that we're willing to be more strict in terms of our infection prevention control in these facilities? Well, I think it's a warranted bias. I'm not sure it's ageism, but but I think the the concern um, that led us to such strict controls, um, even though it's warranted, is is concerning. And we'd like to hear more from the voice of the residents and how they're doing. Um, they're often not at uh, all of our tables uh, as the voice of experience. So it's good that that would help counteract some of what you're talking about. Pauline, I, I wonder if we could just stay with this for a second because it, 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 it really is a tough nut to crack and there's another side to it, right? So, so, so I'm a geriatrician, so I commonly see people who have many of the diseases of aging kind of all at once. At the same time, um, uh, we do see people who are the worried well, who are very concerned because they've forgotten the name of someone that they knew and such. And part of that is indeed normal aging, quote unquote. But a really important part of being successful, of living in a successful way 
is the ability to accept the decrements that do come with aging. So, so, so it's undoubtedly the case that even the most, you know, yoga practicing, yogurt eating, Birkenstock wearing, jogging person is going to encounter ways in which they notice the impact of age. And it's really important that they have a way to do that with equanimity. And some part of that is in the language they use to describe it. So, so, so I think that's another thing that makes this very tough in pragmatic terms, because we also have to be able to accept, we can't just deny what goes on with aging. Again, the, 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 the end of it that I see is, is, is not uncommonly people who will say they can't believe they look like they do. They can't believe they can do as few things as they're able to do. In their minds, they're still remembering themselves as whatever their favorite time is, which interestingly for people when they're ill is often in their 50s because uh, uh, the mortgage is paid and the kids have grown up and they've reconciled themselves to their ambition and they hadn't started to get sick yet and they still have their friends, right? Like it is very compelling what happens in a routine way, the vicissitudes that go with aging. We have to have a way you can still engage in that and acknowledge it and acknowledge some of the pain that goes with it for the people who are experiencing that sense and that's a much broader thing. That's a societal thing as much as a long-term care and a health system thing, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, do, do Janice or David, do you want to add anything more on that topic? I, I no, I, I mean, I think Nick, he's, he's hit the nail on the head. I mean, I think there's just, there's so many aspects of this and in terms of long-term care, there's so much we need to be doing uh, you know, in terms of this panel to help uh, support and change, fix long-term care. Um, ageism is a much wider, bigger nut to crack, right? And we still have to do it in tandem, but I, I, I think we also need to also stay focused on some of the solutions for long-term care. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if if how we spend our money is an indicator of where we place our priorities, mm -hmm. and if there is some commitment in the wake of a pandemic to place more money and a higher priority on an elderly population and the funding of long-term care, where should that additional money come from? And David, maybe I'll begin with you as somebody who's you know working within government. I thought you were gonna ask where the money should go. Um, but uh, where the money should come from, I, I, I'm not sure I'd be qualified to speak to that. I do, uh, Dr. Keefe's uh, suggestion the federal government has a role to play certainly makes sense. I think we, as a, a province, uh, tried to support our long-term care facilities through the COVID pandemic as well, um, financially. I think the, the biggest issue, when I look at controlling the COVID, uh, pandemic relative to long-term care has been around resourcing and staff. Uh, maybe that's too broad of a brush. Um, I would say the a lot of the controls we need to put in place to stop something like that is staff dependent, whether it's for screening, whether it's for more infection prevention, whether it's for caring for the residents who are getting stressed out and, and need more support. Um, it, it just all seems to come back to staff. And then that makes us try and decide whether we should loosen some of our restrictions because we just can't pull it off. And that's risky. So we, luckily in PI, we weren't in that situation uh, very often, but I can see the concerns. Janice, if, if you need to get some money uh, to place a, a new priority on long-term care, where do you think it should come from? Yeah, that's a it's a really good question. I think there's not a lot of um, uh, amount of money in the healthcare system that can be shifted, um, but there there tends to be long term care tends to be always the poor cousin, always at the end of the pile. And uh, new beds aside, um, you know, some of those new beds that, that were mentioned are in fact to enable people to have single rooms. And that's a critical issue. But, but it's not 
um, I, I'm a very strong believer in, in that federal role. And I know that people say, well, oh no, it's the provincial territorial uh, government's uh, area jurisdiction. But at the same time, I, I believe that the federal government needs to put much more emphasis on um, the lives of our older population and ensuring that uh, the places where they need to live to get care at the end of their life is a place that is providing them good quality care and good quality of life. And that can happen in my mind and in the Royal Society report, we emphasize this without accountability. We can't just throw dollars at provinces and say, fix the system. We need to be able to uh, measure what has been done and how it's improved the lives of the residents and their family that live in the community. Yeah, thank you. And and Ken, from your comments on the bids versus, you know, $250 a day for other things, I, I expect you have thoughts on this. Yeah, I do. So 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 obviously we're gonna have to have money from government. It won't work without that. Um, I think that there are opportunities that, you know, first let me say I'm an old fashioned small L liberal sort of thing. I'm a geriatrician, right? So that's a statement. Um, uh, so, so uh, but I would see a role for the private sector if we can focus on its the virtue in creating value, right? So, so, so often in long-term care, we see a lot of value harvesting. They're, 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 they, you know, they've set up room and board, and they're trying to extract value from it in the most efficient way that they can. But it's also possible to to create value, particularly in the way we handle information. A lot of what goes on in um, in healthcare for older adults uh, is something in, in in which there's a lot of inefficiency because of the poor way in which we are able to communicate and handle information. And some of it sounds mundane, like repetitive testing and those sorts of things. But but there's we haven't organized ourselves in a way that uh, uh, that builds some efficiencies in. And it would seem to me that that um, uh, groups of people who are able to organize information so that it's, that it's presented in a much more efficient way will do well in this environment. And so when I talk about the ways in which the province could lead, there's no a priori reason that we couldn't lead in that. There's no a priori reason that we couldn't actually work with the, the, the people that we have to hand you know, in, in, in the sector that de deals with information technology and incent them to try and tackle th this issue. There's no reason we shouldn't also look to import whatever the best technology is from uh, some other place. But I think th this is one of the ways in, in which we would want to try and think big on this. It's also the case that a lot of routine care is inordinately and unreasonably expensive. We're doing things in hospital care that we really don't need to do. And I'm not saying rationing care or anything like that. I'm saying that we haven't paid sufficient attention to the ways in which some of our interventions have a net cause for harm. So, 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 so there are ways in which more cost effective spending is actually better medicine. And we should stop talk and you've t talked to any specialist, they'll have a half dozen things. Well, they have 10,000 things, but they're all except for a half dozen in somebody else's specialty. But in their own specialty, they can point to a half dozen things that could be done that uh, uh, have the potential to be more cost effective. I think we need to start to harvest those conversations. We need to think differently about how we provide care. Yeah, there has been a program called Choose Wisely that I think was aiming to, to uh, ask people to think more closely about what kinds of tests they order and so on. Um, we do wanna leave uh, some time for questions from our audience. Uh, and if you have a question, you can ask it by typing it in the Q&A box if you're with us on Zoom. If you're watching on Facebook, you can type your question into the comments section there. Um, and I would say that uh, it would be great if you could also um, give your name with your question. And if you're from the media, uh, maybe identify which media outlet you're with. Uh, and also, finally, um, direct your question to a specific panelist so that we can be very focused. Uh, we might not get to everybody's question, but we thank you in advance for both your patience and your participation. Uh, we do have one question, and I know I said you had to have your name. This one doesn't, but we'll ask it anyway since it's the first, and thanks for it. Uh, it, it is, uh, Dr. Keefe mentioned lack of data from long-term care to measure standards of care. 
what kind of measurements exist? Well, in um, many provinces, I'm on off mute. Okay. I, in many provinces, there is a, uh, what is called an in, interi uh, residential assessment instrument, which is, um, provides um, a, a check off the care needs of the individual, their, um, any diseases that they have, any uh, functional difficulties, cognitive difficulties, and then they um, can you, we actually have it in Nova Scotia for our, or we have a version of it in our home care, um, our home care uh, program. It allows, um, it allows us to understand the what will be needed in terms of staffing to support that resident. Um, and so most provinces in Canada, except for Quebec, PEI Nova Scotia has a version of this. It is presented to the Canadian Information of uh, Canadian Institute of Health Information. So there can be comparisons across the provinces. In addition, I work with a group in uh, the Western provinces. There are four provinces there where they in addition, collect a lot of data on the staffing. So staffing burnout, staffing, um, working to full scope of practice, et cetera. So we're actually able to understand if there's um, a, uh, an outbreak. So for example, with the COVID uh, pandemic, we're able to identify how many of those staff were in working multiple facilities because we had the data, we are able to understand by going back to that staff, we know, we knew before the pandemic happened, the level of burnout of the staff is just overwhelming. And uh, I think there's a new uh, question about that and just how frustrating it is for uh, everyone uh, from nurses to the to the frontline uh, care aides. Um, you know, they love what they do, because they love the people, but they're exhausted by the amount of work that they have. So, so those types of data, I think, do exist. We can bring them um, to our region. And I know that from our long-term care report, ministerial advisory report uh, from a year or so ago in Nova Scotia, we are now in the process of obtaining um, these this instrument, the interi long-term care facility instrument. So hopefully in the future, we'll have better data. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, our next question from uh, Vicky Levac. Vicki, I hope I pronounced your last name properly. Uh, what can we do about people who are not elderly living in care? They may be there as they have a disability. Um, David, do you want to try that one? Um, yeah, it's not something that we, that I would have dealt with. Um, it, it, we were working at a facility level. So anybody who was um, in that facility who was living there as uh, Dr. Duke said, as their residents. So the assessment of who needs to be there in the interi tool um, uh, the PI doesn't uh, use right now. Um, it's not something I'm really involved with. I'm not sure I can comment any further on that. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, and maybe from a Nova Scotia perspective, uh, Dr. Rockwood, uh, what do you say on that one? Yeah. Um... Uh, so, so the the way that we organize care for um, people who are young but require the care uh, is, um, you know, it's it's an area that's where I was saying before that 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 we shouldn't be looking for the one size fits all that 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 we need to have nimble options. I think that's the area that uh, cries out for for more nimbleness than we've been able to have right now. So so there are people who will have very similar needs based on their abilities, um, who um, at the moment. Uh, don't have an opportunity to be congregated in a particular area. There are people who will have had different lives that they live and are living now that need different levels of support who have very few options that are available to them other than to go into long-term care. There, there are people 
who would like to be able to work at the work that they do, but who require a level of care that it's difficult to, pr to provide otherwise outside a long-term care institution. We don't have options for them. So, so, so when we think about the nimbleness of the response that we need, I think th th these are groups that in particular we need to pay attention to. The, the other thing that, that is important is to um, understand some of the ways in which that care gets provided now that doesn't necessarily fit within the sanction of a licensed facility, but is still able to operate and, and offer good care. Some of it in informal ways. I, I'm a, a really privileged part of my practice is to look at people with Down syndrome who develop dementia. So, so, so I, I've been so impressed by uh, the sometimes ad hoc arrangements that are made for people with Down syndrome, with older adults now, or adults with Down syndrome in their 50s, whose parents have died, whose spouses, uh, whose um, siblings are older, some of the, of, of the really interesting schemes they come up with to be looked after still. And we don't seem to have a good system to allow for their care needs to be understood and met and organized or for us to support people who are doing a lot with a little who just need a little more to 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 keep that part of things going mm -hmm. i think we are gonna like this is an area that i think needs um to be approached in a way with flexibility and like every part of long-term care we need to have a way to say out loud You'll do best in long-term care. You'll do best working in long-term care if your instinct is one of kindness. And, and, and you can spot that in an instant. And yet we don't really have a way to measure, measure it. I bet you there's no inter eye kindness uh, counter. Nope. Yeah, but there is all. value. <laughs> anyway, yeah, yeah. So, so I think those are the sorts of things that we need to, to pay attention to is a way to make our values explicit. Yeah, and I, I, I think that I'm just going to jump in. I hope that's okay. Just in terms of um, within facilities, I, I think the the question really raises a really important uh, group of individuals that are often left out of the discussion. Um, and I know that some facilities uh, have tried to cluster uh, younger people who have um, who have perhaps same of similar care needs, but they have very different cultures. They they grew up in different. They like different music. They like like different things they like you know different types of uh, movies all of the social part of their reality is very different than the very uh, old that they may have to be sharing um, residence with and so there is an attempt particularly in urban areas where there is greater con concentration to um, to uh, bring the people together in a similar uh, household or uh, um, or floor or whatever the case may be. It's, it is more challenging, of course, in, in rural areas, particularly if people want to stay in their community and they're known in their community. So I think, you know, recognizing, um, as Ken said, yes, there's absolutely, we need flexibility for people. And we also need to rec recognize the um, diversity within the population. So in the Maritimes, we don't have a huge amount of diversity in long-term care, but we need to recognize that that may change in the future. We may have different, you know, there will be different cultures. There will be different needs in terms of social needs, uh, meals, food, et cetera, that we need to take into consideration. Okay. Thank you, Janice. Um, this is a question for you, Ken, from Barbara Adams. And she says, how many geriatricians do we need in Nova Scotia? What else can we do to encourage physicians to work in long-term care? So thanks, those are two separate questions. So we have about 11 geriatricians uh, in the province right now and hand on heart, we could triple that number and uh, still have excess need. We are nowhere near, we are nowhere near where we need to be right now. And shamefully, we're not even training more people. We, 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 we go cap in hand every year to say, can we train another one? What, what, what are we able to uh, uh, do? We're, we're, we're sort of in some ways outside the mainstream of what gets done. 
and and and, and it's and I've heard well you know everybody everybody needs more but that this really is not true we've locked ourselves into numbers from a report you know 15 years ago it, to my mind it, of the many things that we need to, to 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 do I don't think we can be credible if 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 we don't say we're going to make an investment in the sorts of doctors that we need right now for the sorts of difficult issues that we need uh, to deal with right now. So I would say triple what we have right now as a way to start. Now for long-term care, um, uh, so so uh, around the province, we have pockets of great expertise that's um, in many places been done by family physicians who've done an extra uh, six months to a year in health care of the elderly and who have made a focus in long-term care. We have controlled trials data from this province showing the benefit of that in terms of achieving better outcomes in long-term care. And yet the model that was developed here works in some parts of here has not been spread across the province. And it's just an example of how we really need to look at this more seriously. We need to get away from the terrible burden of inertia that we have that's driving us to uh, 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 do more of the same when we need more of something that's different and more appropriate. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have lots of questions coming in and in the last few minutes that we have, we'll do our best to get to as many of them as we can. Uh, next from Lynn Verhoy, I don't know if I've got that right, Lynn, sorry. Uh, she says, would reducing the number of residents to small homes create a safer place for everyone? Who would like to take that one? Is that you, Janice? Yeah. Yeah, sure. I, I can. Um, I think there is economy of scale that we have to uh, consider, and 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 that's the the challenge. I mean, I think the new uh, newer facilities, at least in our province of Nova Scotia, have tended to not to be under 200, to be around that 130, 100, and, uh, 100 residents. Um, the the challenge becomes in the in the very small facilities is that the um, ability to attract let's say professional staff if you only have a point two uh, physiotherapist or a point one recreation therapist how do you how do you actually uh, fulfill those positions and in our long term care report we actually spoke about having um hubs of care so that rather than that that facilities and home care could actually share some of these services so that um all of the residents in the um in the uh facility would be able to have access to some of these specialized services so i think she's making a good point but i do think that there is an economy of scale that we have to uh think about as well in terms of uh having um that uh, professional staff to be able to manage the facility. Okay. In the very small amount of time we have left, uh, this is a question from Olive Bryanton saying, how can we start a conversation that includes healthcare specialists, older adults, caregivers to look upstream for innovative strategies? Uh, 30 seconds to each of you, if you would weigh in on that. Uh, do you want to start since your mic is on, Janice? <laughs> That's a tough one. I think it it's about getting getting together, asking our politicians, putting the the um, the questions and messaging about the value of long term care, about what could be innovative solutions. We can't all do what they're maybe doing in in certain other European countries, um, but we can still uh, make some attempts at, at innovation for sure, but it does need leadership and it does need funding. Okay, uh, 30 seconds to you, David. I hope that's the all of Bryanton from PEI and if so. Uh, yes, it is, David. Well, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, and, you know, in terms of keeping residents uh, out of long-term care, but, you know, why would we do that if it's a good place to be in the first place? Um, but really, we in public health, we are interested in prevention. Um, the idea of working upstream makes good health sense. It makes good economic sense. It's chronically underfunded, and that's where we need to operate. Um, it does take many stakeholders at the table. How you govern that and, and operate that 
very difficult. I do think health has a leadership role at bringing the stakeholders together. And, um, and I think public health has a role in that as well. Thank you. And I'm gonna to have to intervene and end it there. And I'm sorry, Ken, we're not coming to you. We're running out of time. And I do wanna say thank you to everybody both to you, the panelists, and to everyone watching who joined us. Uh, there will be a video recording of today's panel discussion. It'll be shared on the McKechnie Institute's YouTube channel and website. And thank you to the McKechnie Institute for hosting. Next week's panel, The Road to Recovery for Atlantic Tourism, will take place on Thursday, February the 25th at 1 o'clock. You can visit dal.ca slash MIPP to register. That's all the time we have. Thank you very much. Take care.